The Ostomy Nurse Project. Hey there, listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of the Ostomy Nurse Project. As usual, I'm Felicity, your host, and in this episode today, we are focusing specifically on having chemotherapy whilst living with a stoma. Now, the stoma is usually formed as a result of colorectal cancer, which we touched on in a previous episode where we recently looked at and had June, which is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month, which tied in with the episode looking at Stomal Therapy Awareness Week. So if you want more information on that, tune into that episode or backtrack. But if this is the first episode that you've tuned into, you may have selected it because you may either be a person who has a stoma, who is either undergoing chemo currently or is about to undergo a course of chemotherapy treatment. You may be a friend or a loved one of somebody who is about to have this treatment, or you may be a healthcare professional who is looking after patients that are having chemotherapy. And I want to make the distinction that this episode focuses solely on chemotherapy and not chemo radiation. And it's a quite a niche area of people who have these types of uh, stomas related to cancer. Yes, there are stomas that are created for a lot of other reasons. um, But in this particular episode, I'm going to be focusing on people that have a stoma as a result of having surgery because of a cancer related issue. And there's going to be other episodes in the future that focus on different conditions that may result in a stoma, like the inflammatory bowel diseases and those sorts of things, continence issues. But in this episode today, I wanted to focus solely on chemotherapy because there is a large portion of people who live with a stoma that have the diagnosis of either a cancer spread or their oncologist feels that they would benefit from having a course of chemotherapy or perhaps even uh, chemo radiation. So having both chemotherapy and radiation therapy at the same time. But I'm talking about chemo today because chemo in itself can have certain cytotoxic effects obviously to kill off cancer cells, but also it has a lot of side effects, which we're going to be talking about today. And in particular, how a person with a stoma may deal with or may be able to cope with certain side effects that may occur as a result of undergoing chemotherapy treatment. So we're going to be looking at uh, what chemotherapy does to the body and how it fights cancer and what side effects, therefore, it does cause and on what areas of the body it causes that. And then we're going to look at how that then affects a person with a stoma and how that affects things like their pouching regime, their ability to to care for themselves and change their stoma pouches and the functioning of the stoma itself. So we're looking at things like diarrhea, loose output, high output, and skin irritations and mucosal irritations. So we're going to cover all of that today because I think it's really important to reassure people that even having a stoma and undergoing chemo does have some possible side effects. Having a stoma itself is not the end of the line for some people. Some people that have ongoing treatment have to go through a much longer journey to achieve their outcomes that they want. And sometimes along the way, things can get a little bit tricky and a little bit overwhelming. So the overall point of this episode is to reassure people that are undergoing chemo with a stoma that there are resources out there like myself and other stoma nurses that can provide you with the help that you need, whether it be in terms of slight changes to your pouching products or different techniques for applying your uh, ostomy products. These are the things that your stoma nurse is available to talk you through if you are undergoing chemotherapy and you do happen to notice some side effects from that. Okay, so if you are a person who has had a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, you may have already undergone surgery, which means you may have had that section of bowel removed. You may have had part of your rectum or even part of the anal tissue removed, depending on what type of operation that you've had. The resulting stoma may either be a colostomy, which is a stoma of the large intestine, or it may be a ileostomy, which is a stoma of the ileum or the small intestine. Now, these may be permanent or temporary, but people with both permanent and temporary stomas can still undergo adjuvant chemotherapy um, with their relevant treatment regimes. 
And one of the most common questions that I get asked as a stoma nurse is for particularly people who have a temporary stoma whilst they are about to undergo chemotherapy treatment, a lot of people ask, well, why don't they just reverse me before I go and do chemo? Or why can't I have my stoma reversed uh, in between chemotherapy treatments? And the simple answer to that is, we don't want to create another surgical incision and put you in a situation where you are trying to heal a wound, which is what it will be, as well as going through chemotherapy. Chemotherapy will knock off many of the good cells in your system and it will combat and hinder the effects of healing that would be trying to take place if your surgeon was to reverse your stoma either before or during your chemotherapy treatments. So that's why the common consensus is that if you have a temporary stoma done and then find out that you are about to undergo a series of chemotherapy treatments, they tend to leave the stomas in place until chemotherapy has ceased and then they will often book you in and scan you and see if reversal is an option for you at that stage. But that's the general reason why they will not reverse you before or after chemotherapy treatment when you've already had your tumour surgically removed. Now, it used to be a common practice that you would undergo chemotherapy prior to having your bowel resection or the affected area removed. That's a practice that's not often done these days. Sometimes it is before having a stoma surgery or having the bowel resection done. It depends on the type of cancer that you have, the size of the tumor, how much or how little it has progressed, and whether an oncologist thinks that they may be able to reduce the size of that tumor before having it operated on. But equally on the opposite end of the scale, some people are what we call diverted before they undergo chemotherapy treatment. And some people even have chemotherapy before and after their surgery. It depends on the clearance rates, whether or not all of the cancer or the tumor cells have been removed surgically, and whether an oncologist thinks that your patient would benefit from having ongoing treatment and try and remove any remaining cancer cells. So that might be a reason that you would be having chemotherapy, either before you have your bowel surgery or even after you've had your bowel surgery to tidy up and clear away any further cancer cells. Now, to understand exactly how chemotherapy affects living with a stoma, it's important to understand exactly what chemotherapy is, what it does, and how it works in your body. And there's lots of different types of cancer treatments, but I'm just going to focus in a general manner here. Chemo is obviously a drug, so either in a tablet form or an infusion form that is put into your body, and it targets cells that grow and divide quickly like cancer cells. So there are some cancer drugs that work specifically on cancer cells, and there are some chemo drugs that work in the general principle of targeting cells that grow and divide quickly. Now here's the kicker. If a chemotherapy drug is designed to seek out and destroy cells that reproduce quickly, there are a lot of different cell types in your body alone that actually divide quickly. And these are things like um, cells in your skin. Your skin regenerates itself almost every month to a brand new layer of skin. That is a cell that regenerates quickly. Your hair regenerates quickly. When you cut your hair, how quickly does it grow back? Tissue of the intestines and particularly tissue of bone marrow. So these are other cells in your body, not necessarily cancer cells, that can be affected by the action of chemotherapy. Chemo often, in many cases, can't distinguish between what's cancer and what's not. It simply targets a rapidly dividing cell and exerts its action on that. There are other chemo drugs which we call actively selective drugs chemo drugs which do target certain types of cells but for the purpose of this episode today I want to highlight the fact that chemo in general if it is floating around your system it will not distinguish or it will not discriminate between an actively dividing cell in an unaffected part of your body as opposed to a cancerous tumor affected part of your body and this is where the issues start to come in so unlike radiation or surgery, which are very specific and can target certain areas of cancer, chemo works throughout your whole body. 
but it can affect those fast growing healthy cells like I just mentioned, so your skin, your hair, your intestines and your bone marrow. And that is where we come into issues and that's where it causes some of the side effects that we know of um, or that are synonymous with chemo treatment. So things like dry skin, um, losing your hair, tummy upsets, um, issues with your bone marrow production, which is why people who are on chemo often have to have a lot of blood tests to make sure that their bone marrow levels are okay in their system. And it's all because of how chemotherapy works. And unfortunately, the catch-22 of chemotherapy or the general purpose of chemotherapy, and it's not nice to say it, is to destroy enough cells in your body to a point where essentially cancer can no longer grow. It cannot find an energy source and it shrinks itself as a result of those cytotoxic drugs. Now, when I read out to you some of the common side effects that are caused by chemotherapy, these are side effects that can affect people with or without a stoma. They are the general type of side effects as a result of having chemotherapy. And they can include fatigue, so extreme fatigue, lethargy, Hair loss, as I mentioned before, some people do and some people don't lose their hair, but that is one of the side effects of some chemotherapy drugs. You may bruise or bleed easily um, to do mostly with the bone marrow or your blood counts. Uh, you may be susceptible to infections of other types. You may have anemia, which is uh, low red blood cell counts, as I mentioned before. You might experience nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting, if you've seen a lot of movies about people who are going through chemo, it seems to be a common side effect where you have nausea and vomiting after a chemotherapy treatment. There's also appetite changes probably to do with the nausea and vomiting, but you may not feel like eating a great deal and you may uh, become malnourished as a result of that. And then constipation and diarrhea are also side effects of chemotherapy. And the latter of these side effects is where we start to look at how that can then affect you if you are a person who is living with a stoma. Because particularly things like infections, nausea and vomiting, appetite changes, constipation and diarrhea are all going to affect how you manage your stoma. And this is where we start to get into pouching options, changing techniques, skin care. If you are going through chemotherapy and you do happen to experience these side effects. Let's go through them individually a little bit more in depth. If we're looking at bruising and bleeding more easily, that is sometimes a side effect of chemotherapy. And it's not typically a usual concern for people. Yes, people going through chemo might notice that they get bruises a bit easier than they used to, or they might have to be careful, you know, with chopping their veggies and, and making sure that they don't get cuts. When you live with a stoma, the message to take away from that is sometimes you may inadvertently damage the delicate tissue around your stoma and especially the stoma itself because it has no nerve endings. If you happen to bump your stoma or bump your abdomen where your stoma is or even wear clothes like a tight fitting belt that may rub or put pressure on your skin, you may be susceptible to developing some bruising or bleeding in or around your stoma. So that's something to be aware of if you are going through chemotherapy, that you may need to be a little bit careful with the types of clothing that you wear and with protecting that area from any uh, external mechanical force damage. And I've spoken in previous episodes before about stoma protectors. That's an option if it's a concern for you or if you are going through chemotherapy and you notice that you are developing bruises or, or skin damage around your pouch for whatever reason. So if you want to, you can jump online and explore those. They're available overseas or, or for purchase online. But being able to protect the skin around your stoma is obviously going to make your pouching regime easy and make sure that you are looking after your skin well enough to get a good seal from your pouch and to make sure that your stoma stays healthy. Now, one of the things that people living with a stoma may not also realize is that if you are susceptible to bleeding and bruising, if you wear a particularly rigid convex pouch or even a flat pouch that has a rigid flange, say in a two-piece mechanical system, or even a flange that has hard, rigid plastic belt loops or anything of such, those hard, rigid plastic areas or that depth of convexity can actually put undue pressure on the skin around your stoma and that itself can cause bleeding 
or bruising. So that's another thing to bear in mind that if you are undergoing chemotherapy with a stoma, you may happen to notice that you get some bruising around your pouching system, which may look like a bruise immediately around the stoma itself or in a particular area if it's sitting underneath a very hard, rigid plastic area. And if that's a concern to you, or if you do find that that is the case, it's important to get in touch with your stomal therapy nurse because we may need to switch you temporarily to an alternative that is a lot softer and gentle on your skin during the course of your chemotherapy treatment to try and help heal that bruising or prevent further damage or bleeding as a result of that hard, rigid plastic. That's something that your stoma nurse can recommend for you during your chemotherapy treatment course. Let's look at one of the other issues that some people commonly experience when they undergo chemotherapy. And this is a condition that we call chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, or CIPN. And it's peripheral neuropathy, which is damage to the nerves in your body. Now, what this might present as is numbness or tingling, sometimes a feeling of pins and needles, particularly in the hands or the feet. You might have a burning sensation in your hands or your fingers. You may have a numbness, particularly around the mouth. You may have some sort of loss of sensation to touch. And sometimes people describe it as what they call feeling like you're wearing gloves. So when you touch things, you don't necessarily get the full sensation of it. Instead, it might be like a dullness or a numbing sensation in your hands and your fingers. And what do our hands and our fingers do? They are responsible for changing your pouch, perhaps for stretching a seal, perhaps for pulling off the backing film from a base plate, perhaps even to click on a plastic uh, flange ring onto the uh, two-piece system, either in a mechanical or an adhesive coupling. And if you are suffering from symptoms of this neuropathy, you may find it difficult to actually apply your pouch in the usual fashion. If you have got numbness and tingling in your hands, depending on the severity of it, that may affect your ability to perform your pouching regime like you normally would. And again, this is a sensational issue where you might need to get in touch with a stomal therapy nurse who can recommend perhaps a one-piece system or perhaps a pouch with a different drainable end or perhaps any type of product or accessory that may help or assist you in applying it correctly or making it easier for you to apply your pouch properly and protect the skin and get good adhesion. Now, some of the things that you can try and do if you are a person who has a stoma and you are developing these symptoms of neuropathy, perhaps the tingling in your hands or your fingers, is make sure that when you do your pouching regime that your hands are nice and warm. Extreme temperatures can actually worsen the symptoms of neuropathy. So if you happen to be changing your pouch on a particularly cold morning, you may find that the symptoms are worse. So make sure you spend time making sure that your hands are nice and warm to the touch so that when you do start your pouching regime, the symptoms may or may not be slightly lessened. Other suggestions include massage, particularly with lotions or creams, and this may help you with your pouching regime to try and keep that sensation going long enough to get your pouch on correctly. But again, as I said before, if the symptoms are that severe, talk to your stoma nurse because we may be able to implement a different pouching regime that you may find easier to manipulate and still remain independent with your pouching techniques. Now, although the signs of neuropathy can appear quite suddenly, the change in the sensation in the nerves usually tends to build gradually and it can actually get worse with each additional dose of chemo. So it's usually at its worst right after you've just had chemo and it tends to back off or, or get less just before you are due to have your next treatment. So you may find it's quite dynamic. You may have trouble with the sensation immediately after a chemotherapy dose and it may get better as time goes on but if you are intermittently having chemotherapy treatments you may find that this neuropathy affects you at different stages throughout the course of chemotherapy. Now the symptoms of this neuropathy usually are at their peak anywhere from three to five months after the last dose of chemotherapy is taken. So even after chemotherapy finishes, these abnormal sensations can continue, uh, sometimes even permanently for some really severe cases. 
Now, the, these sensations or the lack of sensation may disappear completely in some people after you've finished chemotherapy treatment and you may be able to get back to your previous pouching regime quite easily. The symptoms, however, may only lessen by a little bit or they may involve smaller areas on the body. But importantly, if the sensation or the neuropathy does get better, it's often via a gradual process and it usually requires several months to get better. However, in some cases, it can inevitably be irreversible and it may never get better for some people who are really severely affected. And so this is where you need to be in touch with your stoma nurse, who again may need to change your regime to make future pouching uh, treatments and techniques easier for you. Okay, on to the next. Constipation and diarrhea. Now, particularly uh, for those living with a stoma, constipation and diarrhea can happen with a stoma. If you are a person who has a colostomy, you may find that you have experienced constipation, or you may find that you've experienced what we call pancaking, which is where too much moisture is absorbed from the feces in the large colon, and by the time it comes out into your pouch, it's very thick and very sticky and doesn't drop down out of your stoma into the pouch or the collection device. And so that can be quite difficult for your pouching regime because you may find that you're having to change your bags more frequently due to leakage underneath, where the force of the feces doesn't drop down, it gets underneath your adhesive wafer and it pushes the bag off for you. I know we don't like to talk about these things, but this is the forum to explore that because particularly with chemotherapy, and I'm going to explain why in a minute, you can experience constipation, whether it be because of some nausea or vomiting, which can lead to dehydration, or as I've just mentioned, neuropathy. So damage to the nerves as a result of chemotherapy can actually also damage the nerves in the bowel, and this may cause constipation, or it might worsen constipation. Combine that with a person who's having chemo who might have nausea and vomiting, the dehydration and the nerve damage combined can cause some really severe reactions, particularly to the output from a stoma. If you're a person who has an ileostomy, the symptoms might be a bit different. So damage to the nerves or dehydration, lack of appetite, electrolyte imbalances can lead to conditions such as an ileus, an intestinal blockage, or high output. So just looking at constipation, people with cancer can have constipation for a lot of different reasons, including the tumour itself. If you are a person who has not yet had your tumour resected, but you have a diverting colostomy for any reason, that tumour itself may be putting pressure on other areas of the body, depending on where it is. Or if you happen to have multiple cancers throughout the body, the tumour itself can cause constipation or pressure or causing a blockage in the bowel. Other factors that increase the risk of developing constipation, particularly with a stoma, are things like a lowered fluid intake, which I just mentioned, loss of appetite, a lack of fiber or bulk forming foods. So we've talked about that before. If you are not having enough fiber because you may not have an appetite because of the chemo and you might not be feeling well enough to eat lots of foods or lots of healthy fibrous foods, you may find that that lack of fiber um, can cause you constipation. The overuse of laxatives, motility agents, uh, a low level of physical activity or a lot of bed rest. So if you haven't been feeling particularly well and you've been sleeping a lot or resting in bed, obviously the lack of activity can cause constipation or can contribute to it. And other things like high levels of calcium or potassium in the blood, so um, an imbalance of blood levels, and even certain drugs that are used to treat other side effects of chemo can cause constipation. And these are things like pain relief, so particularly opioids, your endone, your oxycodone, morphine, codeine. Um, opioid narcotics can actually constipate you. If you are taking these to relieve pain as a result of your chemotherapy treatment, they can also contribute to constipation. Uh, some chemotherapy drugs can actually cause constipation uh, on their own. Uh, Anti-nausea drugs such as uh, Zofran or Ondansetron, Granizatron, lots of those types of uh, anti-nausea drugs can actually bind you up and prevent you from having proper stools or proper bowel motions. 
So what do you do if you're living with a stoma and you do happen to have constipation as a side effect of chemotherapy? The most obvious one that we stress to everybody is drink plenty of fluids. And I know that can be very difficult for some people, particularly if you're suffering from nausea and vomiting, but hydration is key to preventing constipation. Fiber draws water into the stool and it keeps it nice and soft. So by drinking plenty of water, the foods that you eat are going to be able to absorb a lot of that water and make it easier and softer to pass a normal bowel motion out into your ostomy pouch. So we do encourage you to try and drink uh, 8 to 10 glasses of fluid throughout the day, not all at once, please, because then you really will make yourself feel sick. But that is done in order to help move that food through the body. Now, fluids don't have to just be water. They can include water, prune juice, pear juice, other fruit and vegetable juices, uh, decaffeinated teas, lemonade, broths if you're a savory person, uh, and icy poles, anything frozen. And even your electrolyte replacement drinks can also help to rehydrate you if you are developing constipation whilst you are undergoing chemotherapy treatment. Now, another way to prevent constipation is to eat more fiber in your diet. And as I said, fiber actually draws water into the stool. So eating your foods like raw fruit and vegetables, legumes or beans, dried fruits, um, brown rice, whole grains, breads and cereals, they will all help to draw water into the stool so that you can have proper bowel motions regularly. You can eat natural laxatives, so there are some foods that are natural laxatives over others. These things include prunes or prune juice, rhubarb, papaya, bran, um, dates, some dried fruits, and even sometimes if you wanted to in the supermarkets and pharmacies, you can get things like fruit laxative bars or new lax bars as we call them here in Australia. You can eat those to try and stay regular. Now, in some severe cases, people do take a stool softener um, and they may take laxatives as well to stimulate bowel activity. We generally don't go to these as a first line option um, because there are many other interventions that we can do before it gets to that stage. If you are going through chemotherapy, though, and constipation is becoming a problem, you can talk to your health professional about taking a stool softener or even a laxative to ensure that you're having proper bowel motions. And these may include things like Coloxal and Senna, Movicol, um, Senecot, Milk of Magnesia, Lactulose, any, any type of laxative uh, that may help to keep things soft. Metamucil is also a really good way of introducing water-soluble fiber into the body and that can help keep the stools nice and soft. And it also includes putting fluid into your body. So Metamucil is often a good way of A, getting in some additional hydration and B, providing a gentle form of fiber to help pass through the bowel. Do use it with caution though because if you are already constipated, taking Metamucil is not going to help you. It will only add to the constipation. So if you're ever concerned, do consult your healthcare professional before starting stool softeners and laxatives. Okay, pouching systems. In your pouching system, as I mentioned before, you may develop what we call pancaking, which is where the fecal output is so thick and firm that it does not drop down into your bag and it can cause leaks by pushing off the adhesive part of your pouch, which can be very distressing for a lot of people who are undergoing chemotherapy treatment or any person with a stoma anyway. But the idea is if you are experiencing this, there are certain pouching regimes or pouching techniques that can help to prevent that from happening. Whether we use lubricants in the pouch itself to help the output slide down into the bag, through to switching to perhaps a convex system which might create an airspace in between the opening and the outer plastic, these are things that we can certainly experiment with and try if pancaking does become an issue for you during your chemotherapy treatment. Okay, that covers constipation. Let's go right to the opposite end of the scale and talk about diarrhea, loose and high output from your stoma. Whether it's a colostomy or an ileostomy, you can get diarrhea as a result of chemotherapy treatment. And there's a few reasons that this can occur. One of the most common reasons that it occurs is when you develop a condition called mucositis. Mucositis occurs when 
chemotherapy breaks down the rapidly dividing skin cells or the inner lining of your intestinal tract. So remember at the start of the episode when I said that chemotherapy is non-discriminate. It targets cells that are rapidly dividing. Unfortunately, the bowel or the inner lining of the bowel is the primary source or one of the most common organs that has rapidly dividing cells on the inside. So here's where you get your little bit of anatomy and physiology lesson from me today. Mucosal tissue, also known, we call it mucosa or the mucous membrane sometimes, lines all body passages that communicate with the air. So these are things like your lungs, so they communicate with the outside air, and they have cells and glands that secrete mucus. That's why we cough up lovely sort of gunk when we cough. The part of the lining that covers the mouth So inside your mouth, it's called the oral mucosa. And that obviously, again, has contact with the air. And we produce saliva in salivary glands to help coat that mouth. And that's one of the most sensitive parts of the body. And it is particularly vulnerable to chemotherapy. The oral cavity is one of the most common locations for mucositis or inflammation of the mucosal cells. Now, what is connected to the oral mucosa? the rest of the digestive tract. And so all the way down the intestinal tract, we've got rapidly dividing cells because this is where food passes through our system. And as food digests and comes into contact with the acidic stomach acids, it is shearing and forcing off those inner linings of the the intestinal tract. Now, our bodies are very clever at regenerating those cells, and so those cells in the inner lining of our intestines rapidly divide and repair themselves without us even knowing it. Now, sometimes during the course of chemotherapy, the chemotherapy will target those rapidly dividing and regenerating cells and mistake it for cancerous cells. And so it will actually affect those inner linings and destroy those cells or damage those cells. Now, what is the result of that damage? Inflammation. So the inner lining of the intestine becomes inflamed and sore and becomes edematous. And that affects the inner lining of the bowel's ability to absorb nutrients and water. So what happens is the waterous or the liquid output will continue through the bowel. It will not be absorbed effectively. And that creates watery or loose output in the form of diarrhea. Now, mucositis is probably one of the most common most debilitating complications of chemotherapy treatment um, and radiation also. It can lead to different problems. It can lead to pain. It can lead to obviously nutritional problems because people don't want to eat because their mouth is so sore. And it creates an increased risk of infection due to the open sores or the inflammation or the ulceration to the mucosa itself. So what are the signs or symptoms of having mucositis? If you're a person who has a stoma and you are undergoing chemotherapy, you may notice some of these symptoms. You may have uh, red, swollen mouth and gums. You may have a red or swollen stoma. So you may find that if you had a nice little stoma before, it may be quite irritated. It may be more inflamed. And you may find that you have to start cutting a bigger size pouch to accommodate for the increase in size of your stoma when it's trying to cope with that inflammation. It may change color. It may be a darker red. And you may even see some whitish, yellowish, ulcerated areas on the bowel mucosa itself, which may be an indication that there is some irritation to that delicate tissue as a result of the chemotherapy. So if you're a person with a stoma who is experiencing mucositis as a result of chemotherapy, it becomes further complicated because if you've got diarrhea or loose output because of the mucositis, that can cause you to become dehydrated, which is where we start to get into the the problematic cycle of chemotherapy, where if you're becoming dehydrated, you become nauseated, you may be vomiting as a result of either the chemotherapy or the dehydration or both. And this is when it can turn into a high output situation, particularly for those with an ileostomy, although it can happen with a colostomy as well. So if you are already unwell, Um, As a result of the chemo, if you happen to have some irritation or inflammation of the bowel from mucositis, 
You might end up becoming dehydrated because you don't want to eat and drink effectively and your bowel may not be able to absorb fluid effectively because of the inflammation. With enough fluid losses, if you've heard me talk about the dehydration episode in previous ones, um, with dehydration comes a loss of electrolytes and water and you become very sick very quickly. And that sometimes in severe cases requires hospitalization for fluid and electrolyte replacement to get you back to normal. So how does this affect those who are living with a stoma? In terms of pouching, if you are dealing with high and loose diarrhea output from your stoma, your current pouching system may not be able to hold the volumes that are coming out and you may find that you end up spending more time having to empty or change your pouch to accommodate for such high fluid losses. A stomal therapy nurse can recommend to you a high output or high volume version of the pouching system that you use, or if there's not an equivalent in the particular brand that you use, they may be able to get you a sample of something that you can use in case you do develop this diarrhea or a high volume output from your stoma. This will help to increase the time or the intervals in between pouching changes or empties and will give you a much needed reprieve from having to get to the bathroom every half an hour to an hour to empty these fluids from your pouch. And particularly for those who are experiencing high output from their stoma to get you through the night so that you don't have to get up every couple of hours to empty your pouch, particularly if you're very fatigued as a result of the chemo, a high output system can be connected to a long bag, which means it can hold up to two liters of fluid in that overnight system, which means you can get a good night's sleep and you can have appropriate rest without having to empty your pouch so frequently. So if that's a concern for you or if you are a person who is experiencing high output or high fluid losses from your stoma as a result of chemotherapy, get in touch with your stomal therapy nurse to see if there is a high output version available to you during your treatments. They are available on the Stoma Appliance Scheme and there are allowances for how many you can order, but your stoma nurse can recommend to you a high output system that may help you with your pouching regime during the course of your treatment. If you have a colostomy and you are finding that your output is loose, like diarrhea, but not necessarily in high volumes, your stoma nurse may recommend to you a simple drainable version of the pouch that you use if you don't use one already. If you do use a closed system for thicker fecal output, they may recommend to you or even get you a sample of a drainable version of that pouch, which means that the adhesive can remain on your skin and you can simply empty the contents into the toilet as opposed to having to strip the skin frequently of its moisture when you're changing your pouches that frequently. And that also affects your pouching allowances as well. If you are experiencing diarrhea through a colostomy whilst on chemo, you may find that you're having to change your closed pouch several times a day, up to three, four, five, even six times a day. A drainable version of the pouch that you use may be of benefit to you because you only have to put the bag on once and you can simply empty the loose diarrhea from that pouch until it resolves. And then of course there's lots of accessory products that you can use with your pouching regime to help accommodate for any skin damage as a result of this problem. So any leaks from loose output or any irritation or mucositis around the stoma itself that might be irritating the skin, you can use certain accessory products like seals, powders, pastes, tapes, you name it, your stomal therapy nurse can recommend it to you if they think it will help protect your skin and allow you to continue wearing your pouch effectively with good adhesion whilst you're undergoing chemo. Now, before I finish up today, I just wanted to highlight how chemotherapy can still affect somebody who has a urinary diversion or a urinary stoma, otherwise known as a urostomy or an ileal conduit. I know I never forget you guys, but I feel it's important to mention it in this episode because I've spent all day talking about bowel stomas and how it affects fecal output. But it is important to touch on chemotherapy for people who live with an ileal conduit because the same principles generally apply. Although you don't have a stoma of the bowel for fecal output, you can still experience diarrhea, constipation, and in particular, renal injury or renal failure as a result of undergoing chemotherapy for cancer. 
Now, there's been a couple of different studies throughout the most recent years, and the results of those studies demonstrate that there is an increased significant risk for developing pyelonephritis or kidney inflammation and renal failure as a result of undergoing chemotherapy. Now, although chemo is generally well tolerated by people who have a urostomy, again, the same principle applies. If you are feeling unwell, you are nauseated and vomiting and not particularly eating or maintaining good hydration, that will be apparent in your urine output. And the principles of maintaining a healthy urostomy and healthy kidney function is that you are drinking properly and eating well. In previous episodes, as I've mentioned with high output stomas, you have an increased risk of developing urinary sepsis and kidney failure if you are dehydrated because it is your kidneys that regulate things like your blood pressure and your blood volume in your body. If you are living with a urostomy, undergoing chemotherapy treatment and not hydrating effectively, you are increasing your risk of urosepsis, consolidating the mucus that is inside the conduit, which can be a trap for bacteria that can get up to the kidneys and cause sepsis, and the relevant electrolyte imbalances that can cause severe malnourishment dehydration and renal failure if not treated effectively. So I just wanted to highlight that people with a urostomy don't necessarily get out of chemotherapy without side effects. The side effects are still the same. It just presents in different ways. You can still get diarrhea. You can still become malnourished. You just have an increased risk of urosepsis and renal failure as a result. Now, just before we finish up for the day, I want to touch on one more thing, and that is dealing with cytotoxic waste. So for people who are living with a stoma, you are obviously going to be coming into contact with bodily fluids. Now, when dealing with your body's waste after chemotherapy, you need to know a couple of things. Firstly, it will take approximately seven days for all traces of chemotherapy or cytotoxic drugs to leave your body. Now, during this time, after you've had your chemotherapy treatment, your bodily fluids, whether it be your fecal stomal output or your urine from your urostomy bag, they must be treated and handled in a certain way to protect not necessarily yourselves, but other people from the effects of chemotherapy. So some of the things that you should bear in mind is that if you are looking after somebody who has a stoma, you should be wearing gloves when emptying stoma bags for seven days after the completion of the treatment. That will ensure that you are not coming into direct contact with any fecal or urinary output. When disposing of stoma output, if you are emptying urinal feces into the toilet, a simple flush and a full flush will be sufficient to dispose of that. Do flush with the toilet lid down so that you are not spreading contaminated waste throughout the facility or the bathroom. Colostomy bags, urostomy bags, ileostomy bags, any ostomy appliances and accessories when changed should be double bagged and placed directly into your outside waste bin. We double bag them because we don't want them to come into contact with anybody who is handling the waste. So make sure that when you are changing your ostomy appliances that you are wearing gloves if you're doing it for somebody else who's having chemo or if you're doing it yourself that you place your dirty appliances into two rubbish bags, one inside the other, and dispose of them directly into outside rubbish. If you happen to spill any content, so unfortunately, as you may know, life with a stoma involves the occasional leak or the occasional spill or the occasional contamination. If this does happen, please wear gloves and wipe the area down with either a uh, flushable wipe if it's in the toilet or paper towels that can be disposed of directly into the rubbish. And again, you would double bag those items. Clean the area down with water and a neutral detergent and use a disposable sponge. Don't reuse the same sponge after cleaning up contaminated waste. And then again, you would put those gloves and that uh, single use sponge inside two bags. So double bag it, seal it by tying it up and place it in your outdoor rubbish. Same as with your ostomy products and your, your accessories. If body fluids come into contact with either clothing or linen, if you happen to um, contaminate your clothes or your bed sheets, again, wear a pair of gloves. If you can't wash that linen straight away, place the items in a plastic bag away from other clothing or away from anywhere that they could contaminate other items. 
when you do come to wash them, place them in the washing machine separately from any other linen in your washing machine. You are going to wash those items separately and you want to wash them for one full cycle with your normal washing powder is fine. Again, once you have washed those, make sure that there is no further contamination, hang them out to dry or place them in your drying sheets and that should be sufficient for decontaminating any linen or clothing. So I just wanted to reiterate that it is acceptable for cytotoxic waste to be disposed of in through your toilet and your septic tanks. Uh, if there are maintenance workers who do service the septic tank, please advise them if uh, cytotoxic waste has been disposed of in that septic system, just so that they know. If you are unsure of that, please contact the relevant tank supplier. But simple disposal in a normal toilet system in your main septic is absolutely fine. As long as you're flushing with a full flush, that is fine for disposal of cytotoxic waste, particularly from urine or feces out of a stoma bag. So there you go, everybody. That's everything about living life with a stoma and undergoing chemotherapy. It is not a nice treatment to have to go through, but just know that if you are a person who is undergoing chemo with a stoma, your stoma nurses are there to help you, whether it be information on proper nutrition and hydration or for assistance with managing high output from your stoma, constipation or pouching techniques to cope with either neuropathy or difficulties with skin adhesion, skin irritations, mucositis, or even extreme weight loss as a result of the chemotherapy and malnourishment. If you are a person with a stoma who's undergoing chemo, make sure you check your skin regularly for areas of bruising or injury. Make sure that you're wearing nice, soft, gentle clothing. And if you are noticing skin problems, please get in touch with your stoma nurse who can advise you on the correct pouching accessories and products that may help to relieve that. If you are having difficulty applying your pouches or manipulating the products that you use as a result of neuropathy, again, we can recommend different techniques or different products or accessories that can help make your pouching regime easier whilst you're going through chemotherapy treatments. And if you are experiencing dehydration, malnutrition, and high output from your stoma as a result of chemotherapy, make sure that your oncologist or your specialist and your stoma nurse are all aware so that we can recommend the best course of treatment to make chemotherapy as easy and as manageable as humanly possible for you. Tune in to another episode next week, guys. We're going to be focusing on radiation therapy or radiotherapy and living with a stoma. So much the same fashion as this one, except it's a little bit different because it's radiation. And there's a few subtle differences between the two and how it affects living life with the stoma. If you like what you're listening to, join us. We are on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify and Podbean. Please feel free to leave a rating or a comment if you like what you're listening to. And join us next week for another episode of the Ostomy Nurse Project, coming to you from down under, right where your stoma is.